Okay, so this is Restoring Your Sanity, an approach to dealing with reference types in the generic programming paradigm. If you were looking for uh, Alistair's talk, he's in beta. <laughs> uh, introduction to me, I'm Matt Calabrese. I'm a software engineer at Google where I work on generic libraries. Uh, I've also been a member of the Boost Committee, or Boost Steering Committee for a couple of years, and I've been a member of the Boost community as a whole for about 15 years. Um, so what's the purpose of this talk? Uh, the, the general idea of this talk is not a, a formal lecture. It's more going to be a discussion. We're going to start by examining the, the formal methodology of generic programming. We're going to attempt to establish a bunch of sensible options to use when you deal with reference types as arguments to generic code that is normally predicated on regular types. And we're going to identify a few common missteps that people make when they're writing their generic algorithms or when they're writing their generic data structures. And hopefully we get into a little bit of a holy war. Because <laughs> that's always interesting. Uh, yeah, don't be afraid to just shout out if you think that I'm saying something that you disagree with. Don't bother raising your hand. Uh, what, what I'm presenting here is mostly just my subjective opinion. And so feel free to disagree. I really want this to be like an open discussion more than a lecture. So just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to start with a, a little refresh of, of some vocabulary from the generic programming paradigm. And we're going to start with regular types. So regular types in the generic programming paradigm are basically types that are modeled after the built-in integer types in the C++ language. Uh, Stepanov, when designing the STL originally, uh, had regular types in mind, although he never really formally described them. Uh, eventually described them in the early 2000s. And uh, other people have tended to alter his definition in, in, in additional ways now that we have move semantics. Some people have altered it to include things like swap, which weren't in his original definition. So here is his, uh, his definition as of uh, elements of programming. Uh, a, a regular type is a type that has a default constructor. It has a quality. It has a copy constructor, it has assignment, it has ordering, and it has a destructor. And so what we see here is the syntax for these operations, but we haven't seen the semantics yet. A very, very important part of the generic programming paradigm is that you're not just talking about syntax when you're writing generic code. You're talking about the semantics of the operation. Uh, the, only thing, the only reason why you need this syntax is a way to sort of interact with those specific semantics that you want. So it's possible to have all of these syntactical requirements and not actually meet the, the definition of, of what a regular type is. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the semantics of all these operations as a whole. So starting with uh, default construction. Default construction for regular types is defined as a constructor that places the object into a partially formed state. Now, what this means is that when you default construct your objects, the only thing that you can do with them is either destroy them or assign to them. And this is when you're dealing with just solely the regular type uh, concept. If you refine the regular concept, you can always go back and add stronger semantics to your default constructor. But wherever you're dealing with generic code and you're constrained on a regular type, you have nothing else that you can possibly do with a regular type after it's been default constructed other than assign to it or destroy it. So for instance, if, if you have a, a user-defined string type, uh, it's still a regular type even though it puts it into a full form state because it, it, it basically refines the concept. Uh, some additional syntactic requirements of the equality that I mentioned in the first slide is that if you define um, the equals equals operator, you also must define the not equals operator, and it should have exactly the same semantics as, as not b equals equals a. If you don't do that, your type's not regular. Um, yep. Why is it not written not a equals equals b? Uh, it, could, it could be the same, yeah. Okay. That was just, uh, yeah. It's equivalent. So in the world of regular types, those two things should be equivalent, so it should not matter. So semantics of equality, uh, a procedure that takes two objects of the same type and returns true if and only if the object states are equal. Inequality is always defined and returns the negation of equality, as we saw on the, on the previous slide. Uh, so some notes on this. Does anybody know, uh, have, a, have a better definition of, of equality than this? It seems sort of almost circular. It just 
something is equal, almost like if the states are equal. Um, maybe they're equal after copy construction? Maybe they're equal, equal after copy construction? Yes, but how can you define the semantics of copy construction without, it's a very circular definition. In the abstract, if any, okay, for any two objects that are equal, no, rather, two objects are equal, if for all the set of functions that, whose domain accepts this, you know, this type, um, when, uh, you know, when you throw in the, the two objects that are supposedly equal, you have the same, the same effect, right? You have the same result. For yeah, so, so I'll repeat that just so it's on record. Uh, the, the answer was for any, I'm going to assume they're regular functions that take two instances of equal objects, uh, they will have the same exact effect regardless of which one you pass to it. And that's, that's a good definition. Anybody else? It doesn't work with, uh, if you have a function that just returns the address of the object. Right, if you're dealing with identity. That's why even that, even that definition is a little bit fuzzy. You sort of have to constrain what you mean by what your functions can do, what they can interact with. Yeah, so, so one thing I would change in this definition is not use the word state, mm -hmm. but instead value. Value, okay. By value, I mean everything that the, uh, uh, that the, everything that the author of the type meant as a part of the value. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, uh, this is John, John Lakers' uh, <laughs> right? So, so basically, not, not every function that lets you inspect a, a uh, object uh, impacts its value, right? So the capacity on a vector doesn't impact the value, but it impacts the state. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, bottom for example, are both about negative and positive zero. So the, the comment was floating point numbers have negative and positive zero. Is that just a comment, or are you uh, trying to tie that into equality? Are they regular? Are they regular? So by some definition, as long as you stay within the fully formed values of a floating point type, most people do consider them regular. So as long as you are not dealing with things like infinities or nands, people tend to consider them regular. But that requires accepting the, the treatment of them as, as partially formed values. Um, if, like a fallacy of defining equality in abstract, like maybe it's better to define equality always in, in the presence of a certain number of operations. Like what, what I think Louis was also saying that these two things are equal if they, can, if they give rise to same results given these operations. Mm -hmm. so you can't you, observe any difference. If you can't observe any difference, right, uh, then they must be equal. Yeah. If you can't observe any difference, what about, do you consider pointers, pointers regular? Well, yeah. when you say can't observe any difference, I think what you mean is you choose not to observe any difference. We have all of these kinds of equality and value and salient uh, attributes such as the John Lucas term and regular function, I assume, is a function that only looks at the salient attributes and therefore only looks at the value. And, and it has no side effects. A regular function looking only at salient attributes can't distinguish two different values and they must be the same value and therefore they must be equal. And it's all circular, which is just another way of saying it's all mutually consistent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, the reason why I stopped on this slide is because I've never really found a truly satisfying definition of equality, even from you know, reading into Stepanov's definitions of, of equality and their relation to copy. I've never really had a very, very satisfying answer. Um, another way that Stepanov has described it is, is by way of uh, Leibniz's law, which is even still as somewhat of like a, I almost find it circular unenlightening in that basically just states that it, they're equal if all of their properties are equal, and it again ties into if, if, uh, if, if you pass them along to any, any, uh, any regular functions and you give it an equivalent value that it will have the same result. But the, the point of this is that it's, it's, it's very difficult to nail down. Does anybody have any further comments on this slide? What if you add a context to your definition? So they're equal in the context of this function. They're so equal in the context? Yes, I, I think you can do that, but I think in the, in the very general sense of just a regular type, <laughs> The only things that you can really do is relate them to the associated functions of a regular type, such as copy. So basically, you sort of run into this, this, um, this circular definition that like, ties both copying and equality together. And you have some properties of equality, and, but really copy and assignment are the only things that, that you can deal with, that you can relate to when you're dealing in the world of regular types. The idea of attaching a context to equality is 
So the, the comment was that it's interesting to, to consider the idea of context in the, in the, in the context of equality. But there's, there, since equality is only a binary operation, you have no way to introduce that. I think I can, I think I can accept that. Um, so I'm just going to move on for the sake of uh, time and for the sake of sanity. Yeah. We're trying to restore sanity. We're not trying to make people insane here. <laughs> so semantics of copy, construction, and assignment. This, this basically ties into our definition of equality. They're very tightly uh, linked together. It's a procedure that takes two objects of the same type and makes the first object equal to the second without modifying the second. Uh, so additionally, the meaning of assignment does not depend on the initial value of the first object. And the two objects are disjoint. So um, when you say the two objects are disjoint, basically what you're, what you're saying is if you modify the state of the right-hand operand after you do the assignment, uh, that you're not modifying the value of the left-hand operand. Is anybody dissatisfied with this definition, or can we move on? What, what about self-assignment at your first line? Then you assign it depends on the value of the first object. What about self-assignment? Well, <laughs> so the question was, what about self-assignment? I think, uh, it, are you saying that you don't think that it, uh, it says two objects. Then, then it depends on the value of the first object then it does depend on the value of the first object. Yeah, OK, I'll accept that. <laughs> For what it's worth, I took this definition from, uh, I believe, from ele elements of programming. So, but, but yeah, I think I, I think I can accept that. You, you can either consider it undefined to do that, or you can consider it that this definition is, uh, is slightly off. Uh, or you could just like, ignore the fact that those are objects and only operate in values. Or you can ignore the fact that those are objects and only yeah, operate so, on so, values. So you could, that's a good, could, that's for, a good idea. Yeah, for, for the point of like defining the semantics, you could only look like the values, and that way they are disjoint at the moment when you are assigning. Okay. I think I agree with that statement. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. So moving on. Uh, so regularity also defines semantics of ordering. Um, so for regular types, truly regular types, uh, they define a total order. Uh, these are the various properties of, of, of total orderings. You have reflexivity if A is, less than, or a is always less than or equal to A, anti-symmetry. If A is less than or equal to a, a B and B is less than or equal to A, then it implies that A equals equals B. We have transitivity. A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C. It implies that A is less than or equal to C. And you have the trichotomy law, which states that A is less than or equal to B, or B is less than or equal to A. Does anybody have any issues with this definition? Why is it not just a strict weak ordering? Why is it not just a strict weak ordering? Because this is how this is a formal definition that I'm using from elements of programming, and You're I'm not sure. saying that. Yeah, it's 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 just because. <laughs> So right. you can have you don't have the trichotomy law, right? But, but all the things that are neither that are that are not you know not less or uh, greater, they they're kind of equivalent for simultaneous right. <coughs> right. And so and so the reason why so to better answer the question on why it has this specific definition is because Stepanov de derived the regular concept from built-in integral types, which mm -hmm. obey this. And so the general idea of making regular types and generic code that's dependent on regular types is that they behave the same way as built-in integral types. But other than that, it is somewhat of, a, of an arbitrary um, definition. Usually when you're defining your generic code, you lift out your concepts from algorithms. And uh, one of the things that sort of bothers me about the, the notion of a regular type is that it's not very obviously lifted out of any specific algorithms. It's more just. A, a statement of the properties of integral types and commonly useful functions, or yeah, commonly useful uh, associated functions. So that said, let's move on. Uh, so there are additional syntactic requirements of ordering. Usually, if you define greater than, you mu or if you define less than, you should also define um, you know, the other corresponding operations, and they should have the, the appropriate semantics. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you define them in this exact way, but when they are defined, they should have that that same exact, uh, those same semantics. And finally, we have uh, semantics of destruction. It's what ends an object's existence. After a destructor is called, no further procedure can be applied to the object and resources can be declaimed, or reclaimed. 
And destructor invocation is obviously usually implicit, but you can explicitly call destructors in C++. OK, so now let's look at some standard types that are not regular. Uh, and I say syntactic here because it's possible that some types meet the syntactic requirements of regularity, but do not meet the semantic requirements. So we're, first, we're going to start off just looking at the things that just totally are obviously not regular. So we have things like C-style array types, which are not regular because they're not copyable. We have const qualified types. Very generally speaking, they're not assignable. Uh, Move-only types because they're not copyable, non -cop any non-copyable types in general. Uh, can anybody else think of some common standard types that are not regular? You could argue that like floats and doubles are not regular because you could make yeah. So the comment was you could you could argue that floats and doubles are not regular because um, because they have certain sets of values that do not obey the proper properties. But not syntactic. But not syntactic, right? They do meet the, that's that's a good point. So Tony says, but they do meet the syntactic requirements. Um, C style structs. C style structs. Correct, because they don't have comparisons. And shared pointer, because the copies are not, not really disjoint. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So the comment was shared pointers, because the copies are not really yeah. disjoint. I would argue, I would personally argue that they, that they are regular types. However, the state is the pointer value and not what is being pointed to. And so the shared pointer describes a relationship. And so I would personally consider it regular. If you consider a pointer a regular type, I think that you somewhat have to consider a shared pointer. What's the order defined in shared pointers? What is the? Ordering defined on shared pointers. So the question is, what is the ordering defined on shared pointers? I believe it uses, it, it definitely defines an ordering, right? I, th I, think it defines a, I think it defines a total ordering, and it's, it's, un, it's, it's. Regular pointers. Regular pointers. Regular pointers. You can, you can use stood less, yes. Yes, you can use stood less. And Stepanov has argued that we should just have the less than and related operations as, as, uh, as being defined for pointers always. But yeah, so I guess in that sense, you can argue that pointers are not because uh, they, the operation only has meaning for certain sets of values. So some standard types that are, that are not regular uh, for semantic reasons. Uh, references is sort of both semantic and syntactic reasons. You can't explicitly call a destructor on a reference, sort of. Um, uh, we have proxy types, like std vector bool reference. How many people are familiar with std vector bool reference? <laughs> Lots of people, because it's sort of infamous. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, std vector bool reference, because vector bool is effectively a dynamic bit set, uh, its reference type can't actually be a real reference because you can't reference bits. So it's actually an object type that tries really hard to mimic reference semantics. Uh, so even though syntactically it behaves like it's regular, it's, it's going to behave extremely poorly if you did something like put it in a std vector. <laughs> Similarly, we, we, have, uh, we have other proxy types, like uh, a tuple of references does not have regular semantics because it's not, it, 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 when you do assignments, it is affecting um, uh, separate objects from, from the state that it contains. Things in between, we have reference wrapper, a tuple where you have one of your members a reference, string view, uh, be, I think because the equality does not, is not consistent with its, uh, with its copy. Yeah, with its copy semantics. Does anybody need me to go into any more detail about any of these? Uh, so with string view, when you, when you compare, you are comparing the target, you're, well, you're not comparing the pointers. You're comparing the, um, the contents. However, when you copy, you are copying the, um, the, effectively the pointers. So a truly regular operation would be comparing, it would be more like a range. A range would have proper uh, regular semantics. That doesn't mean that string view is bad. It just means that it's, <laughs> so the argument is made by Tony that it does mean that string view is bad. I take the stance that, so I, 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 I don't quite take the strict stance that a lot of people do, or actually a minority of people do, but very vocally, that all types like, need to be regular. Uh, my stance is you should, you should strive for your types to be regular, but there are legitimate reasons why either it's, it's if you're never using certain operations, it doesn't make sense to, to go define them and test them, for one example. But also there are things like um, the result of tuple tie, you know, of, of std tie. 
where you get some kind of syntactic help out of it. And that's perfectly fine. It's not a regular type. That just means that you can't use it with algorithms that have the regular requirement. So that's, that's my personal stance on, on so the whole regular tie notion. Is bad because we don't have language so the, the comment was standard tie is bad because we don't have language tuples. I could see that point of view. I think standard tie is, is bad for other reasons, which I'll go into, which I'll go into later. Uh, but, yeah. Pointed to stuff. Is, so the comment was that they're not that they're not just joint, and the not, pointed to that the pointed to stuff is it's not uh, immutable. It's only that you can't modify it. Right, and so as Stephen has pointed out, it's not that they're immutable. It's that you can't modify it. So you can totally initialize a string view from something that's non-const. You have a const view of it, but it can still change. <laughs> but then you both change, and then it's just yeah. yeah. <laughs> Then it doesn't change the copy, but because you can't change the right hand side string view. But it can be changed. Yeah, you, you can, it's like, like when, when you modify the thing that string view points to, you are not really modifying any string view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, right. so when you copy the string view, those are disjoint, and, and yeah. you observe only the modifications to something else, but it's not string view. Mm -hmm. so, so it doesn't break. When you yeah, do it, it, does it does break. break. Yeah, I would say it's there, there are yeah. I, would, I would argue it's regular. <laughs> there are regular constraints such as remove prefix, and they don't have to count it. Can we move on? <laughs> <laughs> Michael? I actually didn't understand why you said it, it was not regular. Because the relational operators are not consistent with their copy, and they're not disjoint. The object can be modified without you modifying your object or reassigning it, because the, com the comparisons compare the target as opposed to the pointer. The value can change by other means. <laughs> Tony. I turned off so, sleep. String view has shallow copy and deep as a uh, comparison. Okay. Mm -hmm. The real question is: Is the location? I, I think you, is there dot data on string view? Can you? I believe there's a dot data. Yeah. Is I'm... that a salient property of string view? Because if it's salient, you're not using it in the comparison. If it's not salient, maybe it's okay. Okay. So I here's back to the definition. Of the and here's here's another question. Would you put a string view in a set? And what are the what what can happen? What can go wrong if you put a string view in a set? Well, it gets sorted and then the data gets modified and then it's no longer in sorted order. Right. So the the, the comment was you could put it in a set, uh, and it's sorting by the target. You can modify the target, and then all of a sudden your set is unsorted. But really, that value should be disjoint from its uh, from everything else. So it shouldn't your your ordering shouldn't change based on your value your what should be your value never changing. This so. But you ha that's not true because you can if you put the value in a set, you're storing the object by value in the set. You made a copy. So it looks like that it's actually the pointer that's a part of the value of string view and the comparison is wrong. That, that, that sounds like a correct. And, and again, the statement that it's, if it's regular or not regular does not mean that it's good or bad. It just means that it's not going to behave the way that you would expect it to behave if you put it into a generic container or use it with a generic algorithm that expects regularity. And the set example is a pretty good example. Equal, equal on string view is useful. Yes, and exactly. Equal, equal on string view is useful. And same with std tie, you know. So, and that leads me into the section: are types that are not regular bad? And yeah, some people do take that stance. I personally don't. Uh, 
I think it's very idealistic. I, I think that um, very obviously subsetting regular is fine. So in other words, if you don't f define some operations, uh, I think that's subjectively OK. Uh, we do that all the time in, in our uh, generic containers in the STL. We do not have very strict regular requirements. For instance, you put move-only types into your containers, and they behave fine. They just do not, you, you just can't copy them. Uh, I think that's a, that's a reasonable stance. What I, what I do think is an unreasonable stance is when you define your operators to have different semantics, and then you try to put them in containers. So um, that's, that's, does anybody agree or disagree with this? Uh, <laughs> can we move on? Don't ask us every time, otherwise we'll never get there. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I really want this to be a, a more of a discussion, like I said, than anything else, because as we move along, things are going to get a little bit more controversial. So it's, it's at least good if we start with something that we can agree on or see where we disagree. So. I don't want to belabor, don't want to belabor the, the previous point. Yep. <laughs> I might be totally off. But would it make more sense for the definition to be across like classes of types rather than single type? It sounds like our definition of disjoint was a problem because we're talking about this join on the single string view type, mm -hmm. but we want to include the string type as well. So the comment was, uh, is the problem that we were talking about things being disjoint with our, with a, you know, homogeneous set of types, two types that are exactly the same, as opposed to two different types, such as a C string and a string view that it is stored in? Maybe. <laughs> Tony? The Sean Parent's answer to that is, when you, you, know, you have relationships in your code, you'll have pointers to things and everything. What you do is you, you wrap those up together and say, this, this thing is attached to this, and this is my document, and then you make that regular. Right? So you just, you just avoid the whole question and say, okay, look, string view is not regular, we'll, we'll kick away these operators, and then you'll make another thing that is like string view, you know, I have a string view and I have this string and I've got this other thing because I have a, an, an HTML document or mm -hmm. something. Maybe that's what the string view is pointing at. You take that whole thing together and you say, that's, that's a regular object. And that's the object you deal with most of the time. And that makes your code in your life easier. Yeah. So I'll, I'll summarize that comment quickly. So Tony has stated uh, Sean Parent's point of view, which is that you can have these things that are regular, like string view. And what you do is you wrap them at a higher level, and you imbue that, that higher level type with regular semantics, and it makes your life easier, which, yeah, <laughs> I think that's generally good practice. So on to defining generic algorithms and data structures. So when I talk about generic programming, how many people actually follow the methodology of generic programming? Do people understand what I'm saying when I refer even to the methodology of generic programming? So we have a, a few hands. So what, I, what I've found is that most people, when they think of, of generic programming, they just think, oh, yeah, templates. And that's it. And, and just interactions between their types and the raw syntax that happens and you know, interactions that happen in their templates. But that is a very divorced view from what generic programming actually is. Generic programming isn't just templates. It's a methodology. It's sort of like how science has the scientific method. Generic programming has a methodology to it. So uh, before we get into that methodology, definition of, uh, of generic data structures, uh, generic data structures are parameterized on types, values, and or other templates. Um, they specify syntactic and semantic requirements for their parameters. And this, again, the semantic requirements are very important. Semantics of associated functions generally do not change based on the parameters. This is, this is an important point. Uh, you do not want the meaning of your high-level object to change fundamentally based on some type that's parameterized on it. The way Stepanov would describe this is that you're not creating a generic data structure. You're basically just being vague. You, you, are, you, are, you are creating a, a, a template that interacts with syntax with no notion of, of, of semantics or that is parameterized by semantics, which is something that you should try to avoid. It just makes things very difficult to reason about. So that's somewhat of a subjective uh, point of view, but it's something that I hold pretty strongly. Um, uh, Specializations of generic uh, data structures can refine but not change existing meaning. So um, a good example of this, of, of what not to do, is, is std vector bool. Although that's only temporarily until C++, well, until C++ with ranges, because in the TS, I believe, we redefine the iterator concepts. But basically, what we do with std vector bool is we 
sort of still model the container concept, um, but our iterator types are no longer compliant um, random access iterators because of just the details of what it means to be a random access iterator in the standard. Our reference type is no, is no longer able to be an actual reference type. Um, so that's one of the reasons why people take issue with, with std vector bool. But generally, if you specialize your templates, there's nothing wrong with doing that as long as you keep the same semantics for all of the associated functions that are defined with the, the default definition of your template. So in the generic programming methodology, you generally start out with um, concrete implementations of your data structures or your algorithms. Um, so here we have an example of, of two different concrete algorithms that um, one deals with integers, one deals with floats, but they both do the same thing at a high level. They both basically sum over all their elements. They, they accumulate a sum and return back the value. So the second step is what we, what we call lifting. And it's where you look at all of the parts in the algorithm that are, that are different and you parameterize them. So here we have int and floats. We're going to make a template templated on t. So t sum, t star, instead of, uh, instead of int and float. Then we identify the operations on the body that are dependent on the generic parameters. So here we have t result is dependent on t. This operation down here is dependent on the parameterized version of t, We're returning the result. And then you finally identify the syntactic and semantic requirements of the dependent operations such that the algorithms or data, or data structure actually has consistent meaning. And this is the really important part. So, in order for this to have consistent meaning, it doesn't just have to have a plus operator defined, right? That actually has to, actually has to have a meaning. It has to correspond to some kind of um, uh, a semi group, I guess. And like, it, it, you can't just um, you can't just have the syntax. You have to have semantics tied to that. So you repeat the process for refining the generic definition through comparisons with concrete implementations. So once we have that. You can still, it's a very iterative process. You can encounter more concrete versions of your algorithm. And if they have the same overall semantics, um, you can examine the differences and generalize your requirements. So here we have t result equals 0. Initially, it seemed as though there was a requirement that, um, that our t had to be assignable from 0. And perhaps I should have walked through the, the various things that we could observe as requirements. But here we'll see that a string result assigning from 0 would, would not have proper meaning. I think it may compile because of the char star overload. I didn't even think of this. Oh, it it, or it may crash, or maybe we have an overload. We might have an overload that um, there is a deleted overload. Okay, so there's a deleted overload from null putter. And I, but I don't know if that. Yeah, I know we were recently changing around some of the, uh, the overload resolution rules around zero and null pointer, but I'm not sure. But anyway, regardless, even if that were defined, it would not have the proper semantics, which is very important. So. We notice here that this logically does the same thing, but we're missing, um, but, but we're missing a common syntax. So uh, yeah, so I'm calling it out here. What are our options here if we want to make a single generic definition that will work for both of these types? Does anybody have any ideas? Hmm? Curly, curly braces? Yep, that's one option. You can use open close curly braces, which will do zero initialization. Anybody? Anybody else? Right, okay, yeah, so you can write equals t open close parentheses, which does uh, value initialization, which will zero in it for the t, for the, for the int and the float, and it will default construct a string, so that will also work. Any other option? Oh, so and uh, it's Arthur, right? Arthur, yeah. So Arthur has suggested that maybe we can take in a, a value as a parameter rather than putting in the requirement. I didn't. He he assumed that in three slides I would cover that, but I did not. But that is a very good option. You take in the initial value by parameter, then you don't have to constrain. Would this change the, this change the semantics of the original algorithm. Right. It would change the semantics of the original algorithm. But if we were okay with that, 
and just it would basically be defining a different algorithm. So you'd have to use it differently, but it would still be generic over all the things. Uh, there is one more option that nobody mentioned, well, which is you can also use traits. You can say that uh, T must be additive and it must have an additive identity. So I'm going to actually move along with the traits option. Do we have something that actually needs that yet? Do we have something that actually needs that yet? So when I say, yeah, it, which part are you saying? Since for generic programming, you shouldn't be adding complicated machinery like that until you have a comp without adding a concrete implementation that you want to get support for. The comment is you shouldn't add complicated machinery unless you have something that you want to support this first. Yes, so that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable point. So if we had something that, a type that wasn't string, but that the value initialization didn't do what we wanted, then we could jump to this. I'm jumping to this just because I want to introduce traits. <laughs> in, practice, in practice, I personally wouldn't do this this way. I would just do the, the default initialization, or probably what Arthur has dead, said, which is just define an algorithm that takes it as input. But, but I, I do think in this case, at least, like, obviously this is the overkill for like, production code, I would mm -hmm. Right, and the comment, the comment was, it's, it feels sort of like it's a coincidence, though, <laughs> that the value initialization is doing what we want in these cases. So some people may jump ahead and do something like traits, or to just, as Arthur mentioned earlier, just pass it off to taking something in as a parameter. Um, uh, there's another comment I wanted to make on this, but I've forgotten. I'll, I'll move on. Oh, I know what the comment was. I can think of situations where the default constructor value initialization may or may not do what you want, which is if you have something like a matrix type, what do you want it to do? What would you default construct to, I suppose? You can hypothetically imagine something that, that default constructs to an identity matrix, or which is the multiplicative identity, which is the multiplicative identity but not the additive identity. Yeah, and if you would change your, uh, your algorithm to <clears throat> multiply everything up, yeah, you would have one, you won't have as a, as a unit. Mm -hmm. At the end, the problem is still the same. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the, the comment was, if you, if you were doing multiplication as opposed to addition, then you would want that identity. So it's... Well, <laughs> I feel that as long as you're hard coding, fast hard coding, the uh, value initialization is also acceptable. Right. And so the comment was, if you're hard coding plus, hard coding the value initialization is also acceptable, which is, I agree with that. And that's one of the reasons why, in this trait, I inserted an associated function in addition to the associated um, value. And so the idea is that you would have these be consistent with one another. And in this case, we're taking from algebra, like math algebra. We should already have the rules, already has additive identity and multiplicative identity. So we just borrow from them and do it, and we know math is mm -hmm. regular. So. Yeah, and the comment is we already have these ident we already have this idea in mathematics, so <laughs> we may as well. Is string a is string a semi-group? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a monoid. So it's just not, we're not good, like, you know, it's not a full group, so the additive's not the... So not, yeah, yeah, not commutative, it's associative. Yeah. 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 I think you could, uh, the, the one with the commutativeness is there. It's a commutative semi-group. So it's, it's not commutative. It's not, yeah, so a string is not commutative. Not string, but in general, if the commutative is uh, there in the operation, it's okay, called yeah, that's called the semi-group. Mm -hmm. So, why does your presentation on uh, references have a slide from my talk? Have a slide from your talk. <laughs> <laughs> have you presented yet? Not, like, not, not exactly, but... That's uh, a, a, an interesting coincidence. Why are there no references on the slide? Why are there no references? Oh, for, yeah, that's why I said by value to be concise. I mostly just being... You will see references soon. <laughs> In essence, this is very similar to concept maps. Yes, I completely agree with that. This is, a tr I think I consider traits and concept maps to basically be synonyms. <laughs> uh, so, and and concept maps was something that we we originally had in an earlier proposal for concepts that just no longer exists. But it was basically just traits. So that's why I think that's where the term comes from. But it may have existed before then. <laughs>
but it's basically just forming a syntactic mapping to the semantics that you want. Uh, so continuing on, uh, where were we? Oh, so now we're, we're taking our initialization and our add operation, and we're just updating them to use our, our traits, our concept map, however you want to talk about it. And now, to keep, keep in mind, we would then document the requirements. Here, I'm just going to say that we define our additive trait to have an equivalent concept, and you model it if you, if you specialize this trait and have a, a consistent meaning with the appropriate semantics. It, it must, you know, your add must form a, it must, must form a semi-group with your type. Um, T must also be move assignable because we're using uh, a move assign here. Uh, it must be move constructible because we are move constructing here. And T must be destructible because we're forming values and they're going out of scope. Have I missed any requirements? Does anybody know? It looks suspiciously like you're copy constructing as well in that call, but I guess you're not really because we don't know what add does. The comment was, it looks suspiciously like you're copying there. Yeah, we don't really know what add does. I guess technically from my definition, I, I would be copying there. So yeah, we could, we could potentially add that. But that depends on the definition of add. It does depend on the definition of add. If you were really rigorous in your concept map definition, you would specify specifically whether it's doing that. But yeah, so my main point of this is it's kind of hard to come up with these requirements sometimes. <laughs> it's that things, it's very subtle things happen, like the parameter passing is very easy to miss. And, and I actually didn't even plan to leave something out there. I just suspected I was probably leaving something out. Well, actually, I think you didn't actually leave it out. I think I don't. Suspiciously like you were. I did, I did technically leave it out because. Well, uh, if T is just like a bool where add is defined as or, and it takes its parameters by construct reference and returns by value. Yes, but that is not what we did with this. Right. If we were, if we were, yes. But if you say but that, 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 if you say that it's additive in these, assume that the function is at least callable, and it's up to the the trait to make sure that it, it defines it in a form that is usable. Since <laughs> you could, I mean, you could also define a version of additive for a different type that takes it by reference and doesn't require it. OK, so the, the comment was you could, take, you could have a different specialization that takes by reference and doesn't require it. So what would that mean, though, for the requirements of this type if you don't know which case you're in? Well, because what could, well, the, could you say this does not be. require it to be copy constructible. If you, your specialization is added, additive, that knows because it's a concrete specialization, it knows whether it's copy constructible or not. And so how do I know when I can call this then? How do I know if I don't state the requirement here though, how do I know when I can call it? Because there's a specialization of additive. It's, it's Could you just additive. state that, that in these requirements that the requirements of uh, the additive for this type must also be controlled? Okay, yeah, I think so Odin, yes, so I agree. So now I'm I'm understanding what, what uh what Stephen was saying saying, which is that by by stating that your 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 type is additive, maybe we should include the fact that it's Callable, which would imply copy constructability. Technically, it doesn't even, you can still call that even if you do not uh, have a copy constructor in some cases, because, especially with guaranteed, with guaranteed elision in 17, you can totally just construct that in place, right? Even with, the, even with it taking by value, it's still callable technically, even if the type is not copy constructible. I think the piece that is missing here is back on the previous slide with additive, mm -hmm. where you didn't document any of its requirements. That's a very good point. I didn't document the requirements of additive on this. So um, we can do that as an exercise if we want. But the, the, uh, the requirements of it have to be specified, or at least at the moment in the standard would be specified in terms of syntax. Right? You have to say, I plan to execute this expression. It better compile. So the comment was you'd have to express it purely in terms of syntax. I think I disagree with that. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, what for the, your add function to work, it has to say this syntax will compile. At the end of the day, you, if you if you so <laughs> you have to say that this syntax will compile. So ultimately, what however you define it, it ultimately has to resolve into that. <laughs> in, in order to uh, to implement our sum function that uses the additive concept, at some point I'm going to have to call add. 
and then I need to know how to call it. Is it okay to stid move things into the, its arguments? Is it okay to stid move the result? Uh, is it okay to treat the result as an elbow? It, it, like, mm -hmm. you know, and those are all sort of syntactic. And they're all different like, cases too. They're all very different. Just because you can call one with an L value doesn't mean that you have to be able to call it with an R value, right? I mean, these are, I agree with you. I'm saying that these are all different cases. So it's, it's very subtle. This is, we, I, me personally, we can just, for the requirements of this, just to be coarse grained, we can just say that T is also regular. <laughs> okay. So, Constraints may be coarse grained or fine grained. So uh, just to separate out the definitions here to be a little bit more formal, when I talk about a concept being coarse grained, especially for, with respect to data structures, it generally means that you have your data structure and certain associated functions may require certain types of operations. However, as a whole, the type does not require it. A good example of this might be like a, a standard container and its comparison operators. Uh, if you want to be coarse grained, you can state that your container type must only be parameterized by things that model the regular concept, even though you're only using it if you're using the, the equals operator, or the equals equals operator, I should say. Separate from that is fine, or fine grained concept definitions, which you state your overall concept requirements that cover all of the associated operations of your type. So, or, or the, sorry, I reversed those. The fine grained ones where you, you assign your, um, your, your requirements to individual associated functions rather than the type as a whole. So for instance, you would state that your comparison operator is only, uh, only, only, um, only has the constraint that it is uh, equality comparable. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, the standard library approach is generally something of like a, a fine grained approach. Okay. So with all that in mind, we took a little bit, a little bit longer on that than I was expecting, but we're going to move along to designing a variant. So this, this, uh, this is actually based on, why, why, hold on. Well, we'll leave that out. Oh, I am no longer able to switch sides. It apparently has crashed. There we go. Okay, so designing a variant. So what is a variant? A variant is some type containing the state of exactly n alternatives. A good example of this is std variant. If you're not familiar with that, uh, it's a some type. Remember, uh, here's here's a quick example of a concrete of a concrete variant. We've got to move quickly. Uh, member functions are left out for simplicity. So I'm basically just showing that you can have a concrete some type that is not an instantiation of a variant. You basically would just contain some kind of union of data and some kind of way to discriminate them. You would obviously want this to be copyable and assignable, but there's, there's a lot of complexity in actually doing this correctly. But we'll, we'll start with this case. And we'll look at one specific operation. We'll look at the copy assignment operation of this, of this variant type. So first we're gonna start with regular types and assume no exceptions just because that really complicates things. The general pattern that we can do, because we don't know which state we're in when we start the assignment, uh, is to destroy whichever thing is active in the, in the left-hand operand, copy construct the same type of the right-hand operand into the storage of the left-hand operand, and then update the left-hand side's index to be, correspond to the right-hand side's index. Does everybody follow this? So here's a, here's a simple definition. I've left out some of the details because I didn't want to clutter it up, but you can assume that data.destroy here just determines which state is active and it destroys the appropriate one. So the first thing we do is we destroy, and then we compare to see uh, uh, what, wait, what's this? Oh yeah, if, if, if we're currently, if the, if the other object is currently in the A state, then we construct an int because our variant was of an int and a string. Otherwise, it must be in the B state, so we're going to copy construct the, the string from the B, and then we update our index. Nothing very complicated about that. Any thoughts on this? Um, so you said that there are going to be no exceptions, so I can switch yeah. the which before after this. Yeah, and so if there are no exceptions, you can switch the which, but 
but yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's start optimizing this. Uh, if we know that both the left-hand operand and the right-hand operand are in the same state, because we know that we're dealing with a regular type, because we stated these requirements, then we know that we can replace our destroy and copy construct with an assignment operation, because they have equivalent semantics. So all this does is it destroys, wait, yeah, so if they're not the same, it destroys. And we do the same thing we did before. But if they are the same, then, and it's in the A state, you just use the copy assign operator. And if they're not, the, and if it's B, then you do the copy assign of the other operation. And here I've just hoisted out the, the, the which there. This will be redundant for the other case, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so as I said, what are we depending on this for the optimization, optimization to make sense? We're depending on the fact that our type is regular and that the assignment and the copy construction have exactly the same meaning. Does everybody see that? So let's skip a few steps and say that we arrived at our variadic variant type template. So what does the assignment look like now? This is what our, our original assignment looked like. And we eventually arrived at something along the lines of this. Again, I, I, because it would be complicated to show all of the details, I've kind of simplified it here, but it's similar, similar kind of pattern. If we're not in the same state, we destroy. We, we do a raw copy construct of the other type. This basically determines which state the other one's in, so it's, it's copy constructing the appropriate type. And then we update which. Otherwise, uh, the two types are the same, so we just use the copy assignment operator as if with the copy assign operator. Does everybody understand this transformation here? So we do that, and we get a feature request. Somebody says, I want to be able to make a variant containing a reference type. And here's their usage example. So they've got this function called maybe call. They've got a variant of an empty type and the result of, the func of a function call. And you can kind of think of this as an optional in some sense. And the idea of maybe call is if the bool is true, then it'll invoke the function. It'll forward back the result. Otherwise, it, it just returns empty. Then we have this other function that's looping. And it just keeps uh, calling maybe call. And it's outputting the result separately. It's a little bit of an, of an abstract idea. But no, that a reference type is not regular. Originally, we stated that our types required regularity here. So when we get this feature request, what are our options? First, we can say that it's not a defect, move on with our life and say, don't do that. It's actually a reasonable option. <laughs> we can just sanction everything that would compile. So in other words, if the way that we implemented our variant, if it happens to compile for, ve for reference types, we'll just say that reference types are supported for those operations, and then we'll move on. Third option, create finer grained requirements on a per function basis. And any place where the reference type would not meet the requirements of regularity, we constrain there. We can do something else. Does everybody understand these options? Obviously, the something else is a little bit ambiguous, but. <laughs> Tony? The fine grain requirement number three? Yep. Does that mean that function won't exist? The fine grain requirement. So, Tony's comment was the fine grain requirement per function. Does that mean the function does not exist? Which function are you uh, referring to? Like any function that the, the uh, reference doesn't meet the requirements of that particular function then that function just doesn't exist. You don't change the semantics of that function, you just remove it. Right. So the, so the comment was, uh, does that mean that like, the function is effectively removed if it requires something that the reference cannot meet the semantic or syntactic requirements from? And that's essentially what it means. It basically means you can't call that function. If you think about it in like a concepts world, you would have your requires statement there for that specific, that specific thing instead of at the overall template. So you'd be able to instantiate it, but so that one would be constrained. Yeah, and, and exactly. And similar to, to vector move only types, there are just some things you can't do. And that's the, that's the general idea of, of fine grained requirements. So when you do fine grain, grained requirements, it does have some bit of an impact on usage. It now means that if you get an instance of your data structure, you don't know simply because you have an instance exactly which operations you, have, you are able to do in your generic algorithm. You would have to further constrain it because you only know that the very basic uh, associated functions are callable. So there is some complexity that gets added 
when you start going down the fine-grained route. In the example, where is the reference at the name stored in the variable? Is it in both result fields? Or? It's it, the function. So the function's taken here is a template parameter. And so you want this to work even if, refer, if, you know, even if it returns a reference. So that's generally why the person's asking this. They want it to work for reference return types. I mean, this would still fail for things like void, but <laughs> at the very least, this person wants it to use to work with references. And I won't make a comment about void after this. <laughs> OK, so let's compare and see exactly which requirements uh, references don't meet for regularity. Uh, the default constructor. Well, no, you can't default construct a reference. And it obviously doesn't meet the semantic requirements because you can't even do it. Equality, well, syntactically, you can compare them. But you actually don't meet the semantic requirements when you compare them. It's sort of the same reason why the string view doesn't have the regular requirements, <laughs> although we disagreed on, on that a little bit. But uh, Copy constructor, yeah, you can copy. You can take a reference, and you can copy a reference. And it, it basically has the same semantics as you'd expect. Assignment, um, it works if and only if the target has assignment defined. But the semantic requirements, again, are not, uh, are, are not matching the semantic requirements of regularity. Ordering, again, forward along, but the semantics don't match. And destructor, technically no, because you can't use a pseudo destructor call on the reference. <laughs> and, but I mean, references do go out of scope, so it's kind of a fuzzy gray area of whether you consider them at some high level being destructible or not. But, so there are some problems. <laughs> we at least have this one, though. We do have. Copy construction seems to make sense for barely. the, uh, yep. Barely. Barely, yes, uh, so barely. Because are the, the, the semantic requirement of it being distinct types, uh, distinct uh, uh, copies afterwards? The semantic requirement of them being distinct copies afterward. So the idea here, the reason why I say the semantic requirements are the same, is if you consider the you address, if you, uh, is yeah. you consider the address, you know, the thing that you can't modify, you can't rebind, that's the value. Yeah. And it, and they're, whether they're distinct or not, we'd only be noticeable if you could modify it. And you can't, so. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay, so let's do a, a, what I call a naive approach. Uh, people probably disagree that it's naive, but this was something that's been suggested by a lot of people for variant, which is, okay, let's design our operator a little bit differently. And we'll just say we do what references do. So in other words, we do what we can to make this compile. Like I said, you can't do like a pseudo destructor call on the reference. But we'll pretend like it does nothing. Copy constructor works. This works. And then we do the copy assign using the assign operator because it compiles. So we apply the feature. And the user likes this feature. It works. It does what he wanted. right? This, this, this actually will work as, as shown. But then he does something subtle. He takes this, this result, and he hoists it out of the loop, puts it here. Now he uses the assignment operator. Does anybody see what, what happens here? Can anybody describe the semantics of what goes on here? If you keep replacing the value, uh, well, you have a thing. The first time, so it's just a good problem. Well, it's not default construct. Well, it is default constructible because we're default constructing to the empty state. Oh. <laughs> the first time it's empty and it constructs it after that is assigned to the reference that it's already holding. Mm -hmm. So it ends up modifying the first thing that it gets on all subsequent calls. Well, not all subsequent calls. So the comment well, was. <laughs> let's see. Every time it returns empty, it resets it, it starts over again on the next one. Right. So the complicated semantics we have here are that on the first call, if it's empty, you know, all the empty calls just work, you know, they assign properly. And then the first time you switch from an empty state to the reference state, it will form a new binding. But then the, if you have two calls in a row where you're in the reference state, the second time it will assign through the reference. So you have different semantics at runtime based on whether the previous value of the variant was in the empty state or in the reference state. And <laughs> that's clearly not what the user wants, <laughs> at least in this use case. Well, if you don't care about the old values, it will probably work. If you don't care about the old values, it will if probably work. If you don't care about what 
that's not the <laughs> so I guess I guess so. Yeah, if you don't mind like modifying the old thing, by 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 some definition of work, yeah. So I guess I was a little ambiguous about what the user expected, but I think it's pretty safe to say that they did not want it to do two totally different things dependent on some runtime condition of the left hand operand. Seems very complicated and strange. And the subtle thing about this is that it will work sometimes. If he always alternates, he'll never, it'll always behave in the way that he expects. But as soon as he has two in a row, that's when it fails. So it, it may be a difficult bug to track down, especially because you may not even notice that the thing that you were originally were pointing to gets modified. So what went wrong? We ignored the semantic requirements of assignment. What should we have done? Does anybody have any ideas? Not ignore it. Hmm? Not ignore it. Not ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly, we should not ignore it. But what can we do instead? Personally, I would just say if you throw a, a reference in a variant, static assert. That's if you throw a reference in a variant, you should static assert. And I think that that is a very good option. Not supported for this. Not support assignment for this operation. Yeah. So you're t you're taking the uh, the coarse grained approach. This this point. He's taking the fine-grained approach. But yeah, you say the assignment operation doesn't meet the requirements, but you can equivalently do it for the variant. And I think that's a perfectly valid approach. Can anybody think of anything else? If, 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 if the requirements are not met, you always use the construction. If the requirement is not met, you always use construction. That is a very clever option. <laughs> can anybody think of any other options? Could put it in a std reference wrapper instead and do something like that. That's that's well, reasonable. You could ignore the syntactic requirements of assignments by uh, using a traits class. By using it, or yeah, or you can use a traits class. So I'm gonna just yeah, whoop, cycle nice. through. But these are a couple. Go through the lifting process again. But is the real thing that we should do if we want to be formal. But ob observation: What did the user expect to happen? We already, we already kind of talked about this. The user did not expect it to overwrite the, the previous value, the target of the previous value that was contained. He just wants to you know, examine these things as this is the function result. So where was it that we were depending on the assignment with a very specific meaning? Well, it was right here. <laughs> we, were, we were assuming that copy construction and the copy assignment were both following the laws that you expect from a regular type. But while copy construction does, copy assignment doesn't. So as Stephen pointed out, one thing you can do is if a type doesn't meet the requirements for an optimization, then just don't do the optimization. We added this in as an optimization, if you remember. We originally started with just always destroy and reconstruct. It worked. So oh, whoop. I think I missed a slide, but OK. Let me see something. I think I may have accidentally deleted a slide. But well, let me see. OK, well, I deleted a slide somehow. But effectively, what you want to do is just, if you have a reference type here, branch off, and then just use the copy assignment operator. And that will work fine. And it will, the semantics of that is that it will now rebind. So you go back to the original example, and everything will work. So. I'm going to make an observation. Is there anything wrong with this? We were talking about vector bool references and putting them in vectors. What exactly happens here? Specifically, what happens when you use the vector assignment? What happens when you use algorithms? What happens if you put it in a set? You don't want to know? That's a really good, that's a really good uh, answer. So let's start with assignment. What, what kind of behavior do you, do you expect to happen in a naive approach to putting a vector bool reference in there. What happens if the left hand type is a vector, the left hand operand is a vector of size 5, and the right hand operand is a vector of size 10? You do an assignment. Can we figure out what happens there? Well, it depends on the capacity. Depends on the capacity, yeah. Uh huh. Let's assume that we're at capacity just for the sake of things. We'll say, assume we're at capacity when, on the left hand operand. So the capacity is 5 and the size is 5. In that case, you would always have to create a new mm -hmm. uh, storage. Okay. And so it will probably end up constructing them, mm -hmm. which will mean that the ones that you're assigning to will now have references to the same things that the. It, it effectively works, right? Yes. Right. 
Now let's flip it around and do what happens if the capacity is 10. Then it will probably end up doing the same assignment thing that we had with variance. Right. <laughs> it will probably end up doing something similar to what happened with the variant assignment. So for the first five, it will for the first five, it will effectively assign through. And then for the remaining ones, it will form a new binding. And that's very scary and inconsistent, right? Similarly, you, you know, I don't think we have to go through all of these things, but basically everything gets pretty wonky. <laughs> so here's here's an opt here's an observation. A variant of T and empty is very analogous to an optional. And another way to thinking about that is it's very similar to a container of max size one. So we shouldn't be surprised that we see the same kind of odd behavior when we have a variant in an empty state and when we have a container that we're trying to put proxy types in. They both are very problematic. And so even if we weren't putting reference types in this variant, if we were putting you know, vector bool references in it, it would do the same thing. And it's meeting all the syntactic requirements, but the semantic requirements are failing. And we'd have some very strange behavior. And as, as a point, we already stated that the requirements of our variant is that the, the type must be regular. So really, you should never be putting a vector bool reference in there, but even though it's syntactic, even though syntactically it works. Oh, here was the, here was the hack, apparently the slide moved. But yeah. So we can just always inject this is a reference check here. And then we always do that if, the, if, uh, if, if any of the T's are reference types. Kind of a hack. I'm yep. going to argue that you really don't want to do that because now we're just looking at one operation, just over the equal. When, when you're creating like mm -hmm. a bunch of algorithms that depend on that, if you start special casing all of them, first of all, it's basically impossible to use. Second mm -hmm. of all, it's impossible to implement and to test. Right. So as, as a library writer, I don't want to do that. And so the comment was, really don't do this. <laughs> and I agree with that. <laughs> so the statement is you, you basically are making this kind of special case here, and it's making it really difficult to test. It's, it's, it's horrible. Well, that's basically the case where you treat it as this isn't really a requirement. We're just, if we have the ability to optimize it, we'll do it. So. Yes, but I, I, the, the thing I more object to is the, uh, is the, um, the injecting here. But I agree with you there. If you, if you think of it as an optimization, this is OK. But the, even still, if you consider it as an optimization, this check being injected here specifically for reference types, and, and it also doesn't cover proxy types and things, and it's a little scary. That, like, it's probably better just to use that all the time. If you're doing it that way, you should probably use that all the time. Yeah, just you mean get rid of the optimization and just say whatever. That would be a simple thing. The check is really backwards. I mean, it yeah. should say. I may have written the check backwards. Is regular. Right? And not is regular. That's a good point. It's regular. It's not safe all other times, whether it's a reference, a proxy, a string. That's a good point. The only, the only reason why I settled on his reference here is because we don't have a way to say, is this thing regular? But we do have a way to say, is this thing a reference type? But that's not good enough, and that breaks stuff. That's not good enough, and it breaks stuff. Yeah, well. So there's just the DKM. Yeah. It's I'm going to argue that it's not only an optimization. And we're looking at this and saying, oh, OK, we're just trying to do an optimization. And therefore, we tend to do the optimization so when it's a reference or whatever. Uh, we, we should, like, that's what they're saying. We should, still, the, the algorithm should still work uh, because it's, it's just an optimization. What I'm saying, and that comes from the lifting process that we did, which I think mm -hmm. is wrong, actually, because we, we looked at our, uh, at our operator equal and we said, uh -huh. okay, what do we need here? And we realized that it can work if we only have a construction. But what I'm, I, what I'm arguing for is instead we should go from the top and say, look, I only work if you're regular. Mm -hmm. from, just, you know, from the top. And then that's a constraint you put. And based on that, you can do everything else that you want. It's much simpler both to use and to implement. And it gives you these optimizations like that. So okay. Right. And so I'll, I'll try to reiterate that really quickly. But uh, Louis stated, really, the simple thing that we should do is just start with this course ring requirement, requirement of regularity. If it's not regular, it doesn't work. And that's the simplest thing to do. It gives you consistent results. And I completely agree with that. That is the simplest thing to do. And if you're rigorous and all of your types are, are regular types, everything works. The only thing I disagree with is that very frequently, people just do not like designing, defining operations that they know that they're not going to use. For instance, things like comparisons. No, sure. Sure. Okay. It becomes a practicality thing. Yeah, so yeah. I would 
take something which basically says um, you you have same copies, you have the same values in index. Okay. okay. So that's what I care about. Okay. So you're saying that we should subset, and instead of saying that it requires regular, come up with some nice subset of regular that's that you know is, is a little bit more safe to to rely on because we know that a lot of people just don't bother defining their comparison operators and then have that as the base requirement but you still want a fine grain re requirement assuming we define our comparison operators right those would still be constrained or would you not define them yeah yeah and it, it and it does implement them so we would think about it. So it's, it's a choice. So, so it really depends on how coarse-grained or how fine-grained you want to be. And no matter what you do, you're either introducing some additional effort for, for users of this, or you're adding complexity to the implementation of the generic template. So really, there's no awesome option here. Tony? And, and the fundamental problem is we don't have an isRegular. Yeah, and the fundamental problem is that we do not have an isRegular. I don't have a slide on this, but hypothetically, if you wanted to make and is regular, a way to check if something's regular. How would you do it? Well, what I was just thinking about that is everything is regular unless you opt out. OK, so that's, that's interesting. So in other words, everything is, everything is regular if it has, if it meets, I'm assuming if it meets the syntactic requirements, yeah. and, and you did not opt out of doing yeah. it. And that, that means you're saying it has the semantic Ooh. requirements. And yeah, so the default assumption is that unless you state otherwise, when you define these oper operations, you're doing it in a sane way. Then you, yeah, you're effectively lying. That's fine. If you're okay with broken code, it sounds like you are. I'm not going to judge you. And I actually, I actually tend to agree with you on this, uh, on this point. I think that would be a, a, a really good way that you can handle these situations. Reference types would just implicitly be one of those things that the standard defines. Hey, these things aren't regular. But if you define your, your types and you want to opt out, you can do that. Yeah, it would be a useful thing. I mean, a lot of things we can automatically opt out by, by it doesn't have the syntactics. Yeah. Like, mutex is automatically not regular. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, it'd be an interesting thing for someone to go, go try it out in the code base or something. Yeah, I agree. Unfortunately, I don't have slides related to that specific thing. But I, I, I think that that is probably the best thing that you can do if you want to have something like a regular, uh, some kind of regular concept. Just have some way to opt out of it. And that's, that's, that's perfectly sane. And having, there are places. Having to opt in would just be. Right. Having to opt in would mean that every single type that you create, you'd have to say, oh, yeah, I meet the requirements of this. Oh, yeah, I meet the requirements of this for every little you know, tag type you, you make or something. Just kind of ridiculous. So opting out is, is probably the way to do it. And I think that's, that's, that's a really good idea. And then all of a sudden, you know, your, your, your variant just wouldn't instantiate. So I'm going to make another observation. Uh, oh, yeah. So I said, really, we should use traits. So one, one way that we can do it, alternative to that, is we can say maybe, maybe a reference type on some high level is regular. We just have no way to access the syntax in order to, to, to do the concept mapping to that regular concept. We, we just... The, the important thing about a concept is not the syntax. It's about the semantics. And if you could figure out some syntactical mapping that will allow you to meet the semantic requirements, then you can go through the level of indirection of the traits. And then you'll be able to implement and use your type with your generic uh, data structure, and everything pans out. The problem is you can't really do that with references because there's no way to rebind them. So you wouldn't be able to implement assignment. But there is a potential alternative adds complexity to your type. But what if instead of when you make a reference, you box it? And by that, I mean you create some kind of template. And uh, it's, a, it's a unary type template. And uh, this is it right here. And when it's instantiated, it gives you some kind of unspecified thing that represents your object type. You can make instances of it. And this thing is regular. And then you have some way of using traits to access the reference out of it. So what are the drawbacks of this approach? It complicates the implementation a lot. <laughs> Simply not supporting irregular types is the easiest. And this is, this is specifically what, uh, what Louis was stating. 
may be surprising to users, but it's likely less surprising than semantics that they've run to in that original variant case or the, the vector case of the vector bool, vector bool reference. People interacting with the objects still would need to be aware of the subtleties when interacting with it in subtle ways, such as calling algorithms on your, on your ranges of things. They wouldn't behave correctly anymore if you use this, this kind of approach with your container types. But yeah, so why does wrapping work? I kind of described it earlier. Instead of considering reference types to not be regular, consider them to be regular without a known mapping to the regular concept. And we have some way of wrapping and abstracting away our storage type. We have associated traits that allow us to access, that, that take in an instance of the storage and pull out a, uh, an actual instance of the T with appropriate uh, perfect forwarding and reference collapsing. Alternative option, we can do manual wrapping. So in, this is something that somebody else brought up earlier. Why don't you just make a std reference wrapper and toss it, into your, uh, toss it into your type? Well, you can do that. And the thing we just described is basically a reference wrapper, right? Uh, well, if I can go back to it. We can kind of think of this as a reference wrapper. It gives us all of our regular semantics. So we can manually use that instead of implicitly using it in the internals of our data structure. So the, the, the user would So the user would have to use it. They would have to be the one that instantiates it. So that would mean they manually wrap it before passing the type along to the template. And then they manually unwrap at every access. So drawbacks. This also has drawbacks. OK, so here's, here's what that user, the user code now has to look like. He had some dependent type. He doesn't know if it's a reference or not, right? He doesn't know what this function is going to return. So now he has to do some meta programming. <laughs> so wrap if ref, this is just some kind of meta function that will be an identity if it's not a reference type. Otherwise, it'll store it directly. And then whenever we, inst whenever we copy something in, we wrap the reference. And whenever we do this, Louis? I would argue that he should also put, or she should also put, a requirement of regularity or whatever subset of regularity we, we, we put on. Right, and it, okay. So Louis says that you can also opt to just put a requirement of regularity here, and then you don't have to wrap it. It's just a simple void. I mean, this will yeah. also fail if, if a function refers void. So what, right? There are yeah. some types that you can use with that. Right. So there are just some types that you can't use. So some types that you can't use. So you can always just go back and tell the user, not a defect. Screw you. Figure out, <laughs> figure out your things. So assuming that's not an option, we're kind of exploring what the actual options are, though. I, I do agree with you, but at, 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 some, at some high level sense, what he's trying to do here is not really illogical. Maybe it's a little weird. So we would like to not have to tell him to bend over backwards to get equivalent functionality and manually do it. Would be nice if we could come up with some kind of solution. Yeah. yeah it, it really depends on whether this is common or rare case. Mm -hmm. If it's rare, you can just push it, let him deal with it occasionally. If it happens on a regular basis, then and that's not something that you can really uh, know when discussing it in the abstract like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's difficult to tell how, just how common or uncommon it actually is. So there's really no good option. <laughs> it depends on what kind of functions you're actually trying to pass in. Mm -hmm. If you compile fine for 20 years until concept checking comes along. Yeah, it can, it, can, it can work perfectly fine until you run into a use case and then everything, everything kind of falls apart. It kind of stinks. And, and, and Louis said, you know, there are other types that won't be handled like void. I hope that changes, but <laughs> if, if, if not void, then the only other things you really have to think about are, are basically reference types. And if you, if you have the approach of what, uh, what Tony was suggesting, we had some kind of opt out mechanism to concept map to opt out of concept mapping to regularity, then that would be, that would also work. What about arrays? Yes, that's true. Also, arrays wouldn't work, although you can't return a function from an array. Or you can't return an array from a function. So. Well, it's going to decay and it's going to be all weird, right? And then yeah, it could maybe. Well, no, it actually wouldn't decay. It wouldn't decay because we're doing the, we're doing the invoke result. It would fail in weird ways. It's already a pointer, and pointers are just fine. You can return reference to an array. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there are various things that work. So, summary of options. I take the stance that support for reference isn't, isn't crazy. However, there are only a few really reasonable options. You either don't support them all at all. You have fine-grained constraints at your individual operations. So in other words, just constrain your assignment <coughs> operator. 
Uh, you can internally wrap and give it semantics effectively of rebinding. And in, if you do the internal wrapping, then you know, people can put references in there and they can copy it, they can assign it, they get some, some kind of sensible semantics out of it. They can even uh, order, it's gonna be totally ordered, they can sort them. You'd get the ordering based on stood less of the address of the thing. Uh, the, and the final option is users can externally wrap and unwrap. And to me, I actually do really like these two options because <laughs> these, this still comes up in practice where people wanna use these operations. Like, like the assignment, I, it seems very strange that you can do the copy, but... Oh, B, 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 B. Oh, the, the two that I think are fine. I think these are both fine. C and D are both fine. So C and D are both fine, um, and not supporting it all is reasonable, but I, I think if you're, if, you're, if you're making generic libraries and you want them to be widely used, I think you really should try to you know, put the extra effort in to make it work with as many types as you can. And if, if people encounter a situation where they just can't use their type, it's just, it's just complicating things for them because they still need to get the overall semantics that they're looking for. And if you can provide it in some way, you should really try. So what do you think of move only in the of vector and limiting the API of vector? So the comment was, what do you think of move only in a vector and eliminating the API of vector? Are you stating that you wouldn't ever be able to copy a vector? Well, whatever we have, we're doing that now. I don't know how much we're doing now, but we, we, we have put limitations on what you can do with it once it's move only. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of limitations. Like, has that bothered you? Has it bothered me? Like, well, I mean, we, I would consider vector to be conditionally constrained. I'm not sure of the details of how explicit we are about, um, you know, things, uh, you know, overload shall not be considered or whatever, you know, the wording is. But basically, vector is doing B. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in some sense, it's, a vector's doing B. I know that it fails to, it, it does definitely fail to do some of the, uh, like the constraint checking that it needs to, but on some high level, it is basically implementing that semantics. And I, and I think that's a good approach. Had, had vector been really coarse grained, then I think it would be totally like unusable. You wouldn't be able to use it with unique pointer. So you're saying it's B is good for vector, but not for... It's really subjective, yeah, but... Well, you're saying B is good for vector if you need but it's not good enough for vector of reference. The vector of reference still just completely fail, and you're not proposing to go in. I mean, what, I'm not proposing. The reason why the reason why I kind of don't like the internal wrapping very much is we didn't go into too many details, and unfortunately, I don't think we have much of the time. But if you examine what happens when you make like when you try to use algorithms with these things, unless the algorithms are also aware of this wrapping mechanism, things are going to fall apart. And, and so the, really the sane option there, if you need it for support for types like that, is to do the manual, manual wrapping. So I do manual wrapping and, putting it in, and put it in. Now I've got a thought provoking but very, very silly idea here. Uh, if the problem is that your standard algorithms that operate on your uh, you know, sort is obviously gonna do something weird on a vector of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of references, um, but it only uses iterators. So we just make proxy but iterators. But what's the iterator, and, yeah. It, but you're adding, you're, you're immediately adding more and more complexity. So that's, that's, that's the point. This is, so this is effectively the trade-off is like, the more you do it internal, the more things that interact with it have to be aware of your abstractions and you have to complicate your code. So I don't have a very direct answer like always do this in these situations or always do that in the other situations. My personal conclusion has been that in the case of variant, I think that the two options that I would personally pick, and same thing with optional, is either constrain the assignment operation, so you can make instances of them, but the, you know, the, the assign doesn't work and maybe the comparisons don't work. Um, but you can also do the internal wrapping because variants and optionals aren't generally used in the, the same ways with algorithms. But it's a trade-off and it's subtle. We could just we could just deprecate functions that return references. I don't think I don't think that would go over very well. <laughs> so uh, what happened to std variant and std optional? So I'm just going to go. So this this whole thing that we just went through is is basically like a retelling of, of what kind of happened in the standardization process. So originally we had reference support for optional in uh, Boost, and it did basically a rebinding thing, which is the thing that I think would be acceptable. Uh, most people were advocating that we do what references do for a while, and and there are a few like very strong. I think a, a minority of vocal people who are against it, I was one of the people who was against it, but we didn't want to remove support entirely, but it was too late in the standardization process. So what we ended up with 
is uh, we wanted optional invariance to be consistent. We didn't have any papers to conditionally constrain at, at various functions. So we just scrapped support for references. And it may remain that way forever. And that's an OK thing, as we talked about. Uh, but there are people pursuing adding some kind of limited support for references in C++. I think Eric Fisselier has voiced that he wants to write papers that do this. He may have actually already had one in a mailing, but I don't remember seeing it. Uh, and basically, the idea would be that, again, you just constrain the, the controversial operations where you're depending on semantics that just don't make sense with references. So I also want to go into one more example with std tuple. So what does copying mean for std tuple when all t are regular? It just means that tuple is regular, right? Everything works. How does it treat reference types and why? Assign through because we don't have language tuples. Even with language, Even with language tuples, I think the problem is still there. Well, no, if you have language tuples, you don't need std tie. And if you yeah. Don't, if you don't oh, okay. So, so, okay, I agree with you. That, okay. So, the, so the, the, the response is that you wouldn't need std tie in that case. So, yeah, okay. I, I buy that. And so, in other words, you would just say references don't work. Yeah, you just don't have okay. std tie and then your references. So, so what, what exactly is the reason that we have std tie? Like, why do we find it useful? Because we don't have language tuples. <laughs> okay. Well, what I mean, mainly, uh, Michael. Because some of us like references to world of references. There's a lot of power. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Like, can you give examples of the power, power though? Yeah. Besides tie. Well, besides like, what? Fusion is really good. All of those yeah. fusions basically give you the ability to have yeah. reference types that are Yeah. Can I'm, I'm looking for something specific, and I think you you know. Um, several, but one would be like, for example, treating um, structs as if they are tuples, so having a mm -hmm. transparent Right. So you can, right. So you can, you can do like mappings into other types. Uh, one common trick, which is the one that I was expecting most people would say, is you know if you're defining if you're defining things like comparison and less than for your type, the easy way to define it, like it's it's pretty tough to manually write a lexicographical comparison of all your data members. The common trick is you do tie of all your data members on the left hand side, tie of all your data members on the right hand side, and then you use the left hand up. You then use like the less than operator, and and these are very useful and powerful tricks. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, I would argue that just std tie is a really useful utility, but maybe not make it return a tuple of references. Maybe just have it be something different. I don't like we don't have to tie them. But we, we it, it, I think it just complicates things by having your default definition of your template have semantics that change in meaning based on the parameters that you pass to it. Ideally, if you meet all of the requirements of the of the of the of the, uh, the parameters for your for your generic code, everything should work consistently. All of the operations that you define, especially all the built-in operations, all the operations that are defined as as being required for regular, should behave the same way. Uh, and std tie can just return something else, and it's simply not regular. Uh, what are the various uses of forward as tuple? How many people have used forward as tuple? <laughs> So, so, so my use case for, for forward as tuple is because we don't have uh, uh, captures for expanded packs. So the, one, one, one response is that one use that he has for forward as tuple is we don't have captures, you know, certain capturing capabilities, and it makes sense we, to... We can, we can capture a pack, but we cannot like, capture a transform pack. We can capture a pack, but we can't capture a transform pack. So yeah, effectively what we're doing is we're kind of capturing arguments or we're capturing some kind of thing that we want to hold by reference. Uh, I think uh, I also used it yesterday because the only way to get the end element of a pack. Uh, yeah, also to iterate, iterate and, you know, figure out, you know, the, the nth element of the pack, it's true, yeah. So I, I want to point something out here, though. So going to Mihao's example of forward is tuple, what semantics would you expect if you have something that's captured and you're copying it and assigning it around? It's just a function object that's capturing you know, something as references. Would you expect it to assign through, or would you expect it to rebind? I wouldn't assign the function. <laughs> Hypothetically, if you were, can you come up with a, an answer to that? Or? I, I don't know. I wouldn't. Like, like okay. my, use case is to my use case is basically to implement something like async. Okay. Or, or and if you're doing an a so if it's an async continuation, you're not really copying these things around, and they're basically just destructive yeah. operations you call once. That, I agree uh, with that. I mean, I mean, like, literally async that does a post to a uh, request. Okay. So I would personally argue that if you really extended this along, and you were doing that case that you were talking about where you make a function object, 
and you're really just using for it as tuple as a way to capture things by reference, if you copy and assign them, you actually want the rebind semantics. If you did the assign through semantics, it would fail. It would do something really strange. So I actually argue something weird here, which is that while I state that tie probably shouldn't work, I think there can be an argument made that stood forward as tuple could return a tuple, but we have different semantics. We, we do this kind of mapping. As though, as though I'd prefer to just like capture of facts as a transformation. Mm -hmm. Michael. I, I've been meaning to write a paper, but I haven't gotten there. Are you suggesting that a, a tuple that has references in it, that the element may rebind the reference? That the, that the assignments would rebind, that the, uh, that the comparisons would, uh, would compare, basically like pointer comparisons. You get a total order out of them. If you wanted to use the reference as an L value itself or assignment through, how would if you, you want it, that? You would probably use something equivalent to tie. So tie would be the, so for your, <laughs> so for your types of situations, you would use tie. So I'm not saying that tie is not useful. I'm just saying tie should not return a stood tuple. So as a forward as tuple, you're suggesting that what we want to be forward are things that are really treated as R value references. Or Albert, yeah, it, like you basically are, yeah, you're, you're kind of treating them as these, these reference-like things. But when you, when you do get on something like that, you want it to obey reference coll collapsing rules, whatever. I'm not actually s proposing we do this in the standard. I just think this is an interesting observation, and I just want to express my personal views on the topic. Perhaps we need, oh, perhaps what we need is a reference wrapper, which is more flexible. That is, if we have operator for example, we mm -hmm. could have a a transparent reference wrapper, which does not require saying that yet whenever you want to accept like a method or, or, or do anything, right? Uh, but we wouldn't have the assignment. Well, we, we would have the rebinding assignment, right? Mm -hmm. So for it as tuple would, would would basically create a tuple of reference wrapper, right? Um, and then you could do everything you want with that, just as if they were normal, uh, just normal references. Except if you want to assign, then you clearly state what you mean by saying something like you know. I'm not going to try to restate that, but yeah. <laughs> so I, as I stated before, my view is that the core semantics of tuple are parametric over their types, and that really just makes things complicated unnecessarily. So, and there are some situations we didn't even talk about. Like usually when you do a tie, like you you want all of the types to be references. You don't want like one individual type to be a reference, and like we're we're sort of like doing some strange things with our treatment of references here. It really makes sense if it just returned its own thing, and now the uses of tie are no, you know, are not quite as 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 much there because we have uh, structured bindings, which gets gets rid of some of the uses, and we may get some kind of comparisons in C plus plus twenty, uh, like Herb's Herb's paper for proposing um, default comparisons, which is a reasonable thing. So hopefully these types of uses go away. But maybe for like a std2, we should think, rethink how we're doing std tuple. I wouldn't suggest trying to change the semantics of std tuple. And I also understand it's probably a controversial thing. But maybe rethink it in std2. So yeah, and I already described these op operations. So one option is tuple doesn't support references. I argue if you, if you decide that you want it to support references at all, they should probably rebind. So that's it. Any questions? No. Um, David. Um, so, did you talk about um, Fox? A, a little bit. I I mentioned that things, a reference wrapper. Yes. So, boxed is one of the things that um, that David suggested internally in the mailing lists. I have a, an equivalent that I use as well in the internals of the library I presented on yesterday, and uh, that would basically correspond to the storage type that I briefly had in one slide. So manually wrapping and unwrapping. Um, so I proposed this on the mailing list, and I think it cleanly solves this problem, because it gives a real semantic to regularizing something. The idea is, is that you have a type which, you, which can contain any other type, whether it's const, whether it's reference, whatever, and it puts it in a box. And you can take something out of the box and put something new into the box. And this allows you to have a vector of consts, uh, whatever, the, to put something new into the box. You don't have to necessarily call that assignment. You can call it something else. 
but it allows library designers to think just in terms of regular types, and you have this separate facility, <coughs> which is a box that you can put things into, uh, which is templated on type, which you can use to get these special types like const or references and give them a semantic that actually makes sense. So that is exactly what I suggested in... So you're saying that's analogous to reference wrapper? So well, it's, it's, it's exactly so this. And the, and the... It'll be used by the end user, not by like vectors and internals. It's still followed out to Correct. Exactly. Right. So exactly. So this is, this is the option that I suggested, which is called value storage here in this option. But it's exactly that. And the, the drawbacks of that are it is intrusive to the user. The user has to be the one who wraps and unwraps. And so I believe that that option and the internal wrapping option are perfectly sane options. And those are, those are the things that give you the, the, um, the proper semantics that you need for regularity. You have to do one of those things if you actually want the operations to make sense. optional, we didn't go so much with the container of, of zero or one. Mm -hmm. We went with, uh, it's a T with one extra value, mm -hmm. whether this was a good decision or not, right? But we, we're, we, every, whenever it came up, we pushed toward, it acts a lot like T, yeah. right? The, you can blame me for the less than, acts like T's less than, <laughs> it doesn't do a less. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever less than does, it, it, it'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, well, we then, don't really have a better option than that. Well, yeah. I mean, we can we we could explicitly state the requirements, and yes. then, but I mean, we can't unless we have like the, the mechanism you talked about. We can't automatically detect something. And, so. and we also have, and that's you, can, you then take that to assignment. Yeah. Is we say no assignment does assign it because because your your assignment doesn't have to be regular at all. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing you put into options that can do whatever you know. It wasn't done as an optimization. It yeah. was done as make make optional T act like T. So whatever T's assignment does, optional T's assignment will do. You can almost see it too as if if it wasn't um, the other way of going on, on the assignment and optional, you could have constructed T by default and then called the assignment operator on it. Yeah. To get mm -hmm. more, do you mean really the assignment operator? Because maybe my assignment operator prints, you know, mm -hmm. my constructor doesn't. Yeah. But, uh, so I, I want to just reiterate a little bit of what you're saying because I'm not sure how much of this is actually getting picked up. So the general design decision for things like optional and, and why it acts the way it does is because they generally took the view in the standard when it was going through standardization that instead of thinking about it kind of like a container, they, a container of a max size one, it was more like this is the exact same thing as a T plus one element. Um, if I could just respond to that, I would, I would say even if you do something like that, it's really beneficial to nail down the semantics of your type because otherwise, when you use this in a generic setting, you don't really know the semantics that you're getting. And I think there's a, there's a huge benefit to, to being able to state that for all T that model the requirements, you actually know the semantics of the things that you get. And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that was a good decision, but, right. it's, it's, but it's, now we're seeing what the implication, implications of that work more than yeah. Yeah, and, it's, and, and that's, that's why I thought it was really important to give this talk. It's like all of these details are really subtle. The standards committee is not full of dumb people. Like we think about this stuff a lot and it's really subtle. Yeah, maybe too much. And like we got all the way up to the very last minute before we were like, maybe we shouldn't do this thing with references. Like really like the last minute. And, and maybe in the future it shouldn't take that long. And hopefully if, yeah, if we can think about things like box and we can think about the other approaches that are mentioned here and we keep all this in mind that when we design our generic data structures, we should really stick to the generic programming paradigm, even if we're considering things as like, you know, T plus one, one thing, you know. I, I, think, I think that's what we need to focus our attention on. And, and that's true not just for the standards committee, but anybody working on generic libraries. So four slides back, I think you had, you were creating a vector. Yeah. This one. Uh, this would actually not compile. I just found out now. OK, so. <laughs> because the vector bool reference, the constructor is private. And it can only be constructed by vector of bool. I think it depends on, I, I've tested this on certain implementations where it worked. Yes, because vector, vector you can copy it. You're you're certainly able to you're certainly able to copy them around. You're certainly able to copy them around though, because you can return them from functions. Ah, uh, so they so there's like weasel wording that says weasel wording that says that even though you can do it, but the point is it may it may still compile, but if it does compile, you're still violating the requirements, so don't do it. Yeah. 
adjusted vector pool const reference, <laughs> then it would work in GCC and it would not work in Clang. Okay. <laughs> so I think I think I think I'm gonna end it because we're we're a little ways over anyway, but we're going a little off topic, so thank you.